Every seller has a story. I'm Georgia Mampanis, and welcome to our newest episode of the eBay Seller Spotlight Podcast, where each month we spotlight sellers with a story to share with us. Our guest this episode is waiting in the green room, but before we bring them out, I have some exciting news I want to share. Our biggest seller event of the year is back. That's right, eBay Open 2023 will be back for a hybrid event. The events kick off with our in-person eBay Open Studio celebration on September 26, taking place in Atlanta, Georgia, Chicago, Illinois, Philadelphia, and Phoenix, and virtual events taking place from September 27th to the 29th. Join over 10,000 sellers for insights, trends, and access to training sessions, seller-led sessions, category breakouts, inspiring keynotes, networking opportunity, and so much more. We've also got a few other surprises up our sleeve, including a sponsored expo, free eBay swag, who doesn't want swag? each day and many ways to celebrate being a small business owner on eBay. General registrations begin August 1st, but you can sign up to get early access to register on July 31st. That way you'll be first in line to grab a spot for the in-person eBay Open Studio events. We can't wait to see you there. Speaking from hearing from fellow sellers, our guest this episode grew up around watches and although sought a different path in life, he ultimately ended up back in the industry, now owning a business. He is the president and CEO of Time Titans on eBay. Welcome, Rich Reichback. Hello, happy to be here. Tell us about your business. What do you sell? I am a watch dealer, second generation one. So my father had a clock and watch shop and I kind of branched off of that and I do vintage and modern pre-owned and collectible watches. And when did you start selling? I started selling full-time in 2004 after I graduated Tulane University and went back to work with my father. That was when I began in earnest. I, I took forays throughout college where that was sort of the beginnings, but didn't become full time until I was with my dad. Okay, so tell me a little bit about what college. What were you taking? I went to Tulane University and I took American Studies and History minor. It was priming the pump to go to law school, which I did. And I did not think that I would go in this direction in my late teens and young 20s. There obviously are some sort of transferable skills that you developed during your time in school. What are these skills that you utilize now? Research. Research is the biggest skill. It's an integral lawyering skill and beyond arguing. And researching watches, learning about watches, which in their own way are like the law. There is an ocean of knowledge to be attained and to know and the difference between Small details can be big dollars. You said arguing. How about sales? You got to sell yourself as a lawyer. You got to sell your products. Yeah, it's funny. I've never thought of myself as a salesman. I think of myself as an evangelist. I love watches. I'm genuinely excited about watches. After a lifetime in and around watches, they still fascinate me. I still collect them. I love them. And I find that when I can radiate that genuine love, that helps to sell. And it's not forced or fake or phony. It's just, I love watches and I can always, always talk about watches. Doesn't feel like work. So tell me about watches. Tell me about your first ever experience with watches and like what made you realize you really love them. I remember being five or six years old and being around my dad's watchmaking bench and he had parts drawers full of pocket watch parts and just kind of pulling out these pocket watches. And I think the smell is one of the first things that I remember. So it's so funny. Sense memory, you know, smell is very powerful. Before synthetic oils, oils were sometimes whale, uh, but they were animal-based oils. And they'd go rancid after you know, a few decades. Just the smell of old oil, of turned oil, it's funny, but it's, it's an incredibly nostalgic smell to me. And I didn't really appreciate as a child, I didn't have the perspective to know how special it was what I was surrounded by. You know, it wasn't until I was older. I, I remember being a teenager in my dad's store and just sitting around reading watch magazines and just loving watches, loving the design, loving the function. I love chronographs and being around clocks as well. So like the Pink Floyd song, just always these chiming wall clocks and, and grandfather clocks and cuckoos. And I guess I took it for granted. And is there a specific watch that you loved growing up and you're like, I need that? And they kind of just all went from there? You know, it's funny. I, Fortis was this uh, Swiss brand that had a Flieger chronograph 
that I remember I loved. When I went to college, my dad had bought over the counter a Tudor Submariner. It's a small rose reference 7928. And if you're a watch guy, you'll know this. Now they're extremely valuable. At the time, he took it in over the counter for maybe $600. This is the year 2000. And maybe at the time it was worth $900. You know, it was not the ten to $15,000 watch it is today. So I had that. I went to college with that. And I think when I came home on my first break, he had gotten a, well, it was maybe a year later, he had gotten a Fortis Operation Enduring Freedom Flieger Chrono. And I traded him this Tudor sub for this Fortis Flieger Chrono, which now seems funny. At the time, I suppose the, the Fortis might have been worth more money, but that has changed to the tune of 10x over the years. But it sort of started me on this path of loving watches. It it first made me go the sort of eBay watch buyer route of I'd go to my dad, I'd trade in, I'd take this, I'd take that, and sort of gave me a lot of exposure to modern watches. And then it kind of wound me up from there. So what was your first ever experience with eBay? Late 90s. I was sort of a sporty nerd. I did lacrosse and swimming and fencing, but I did plays and I, I loved Dungeons and Dragons. I loved Warhammer. And so I, would, I did these Warhammer figurines and I went onto eBay to buy people's kind of collections of them because it was so much less money than going to the store. They were very expensive. And so I was ordering stuff on eBay from the time I was 16 in 1998. And I think my first selling experience was in college where I was taking some of the watches that I you know, was getting from my dad or his sort of casts off and selling them myself. So by the time that I graduated school, went to work with him and sort of learn the business, I had familiarity with, with selling on eBay and I saw it as the future. And I started his store as Mark's Time. So I didn't actually start Time Titans till I left my dad in, in 2000, late 2009, but I had had experience and that was, you know, where I was going. He'd buy stuff over the counter and I'd list it on eBay and sell it on eBay to the world. And you would receive those checks here back then in the day? Yes. You know, 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's how it works. You know, not only have I seen the watch industry change, I've seen eBay change and I have rolled with those punches for what seems like forever. Yeah. And you're killing it. I try. It's, it's not easy to be a small business owner. It's not easy to be a high dollar eBay seller. It's not easy to be a watch dealer. Um, frankly, if I didn't have my wife as my partner who draws a different sort of income, I'd have to do things in a very different way where I'm lucky. Yeah, you are. You are. So tell me about the watch trends throughout the year. How have you seen that evolve? Watches are so funny. They're at this crossroads of a small store financial value like a gemstone. They're this amazing engineering feat, this mechanical marvel and they're also design items. And in that they're design items, they are fashion items as well. Fashion has trends, watches have trends. One style or feature would be popular and then it would be copied. You know, this goes back to, boy, it started, let's see, when naming conventions came around into watches in the 50s, where watches prior to that did not have names. Seamaster, Speedmaster, Ingenieur, Submariner. That was all you know, sort of classic 50s advertising. There was a jewels craze where they were trying to advertise that you know they had 99 jewels or whatever, which was extraneous and unnecessary, but it was, it was a thing. It was a trend. Skin divers in the 60s, one brand did them, then they all did them. Orange. Doxa did orange and other brands did orange. And then into the 80s, you had PVD, which is a physical vapor d- deposit. It's, it's black coating. PVD in gold, titanium in gold, ladies. You had Panerai, which in a way saved watches. Panerai and the Royal Oak Offshore in the early 90s reinvigorated interest in mechanical watches that had waned. And that really changed everything for the watch industry. But that also prompted all the brands to go big. And then into the 2000s, you have uh, there was a trend for stealth where you had black dial markers. Trend for green dials, for blue dials, for purple dials, bronze, of course. And now the pendulum is swinging back to smaller watches. It's all cycles, much like fashion. It all comes back into style. And it's like being a archaeologist. You know, you look at something and you just know, okay, this is from the 80s, this is from the 70s. 
the next time I need to make a big watch purchase, I am bringing you along for the ride. People ask me, what should I buy? And my response is always the same. You have to like what you buy. I can't tell you what to like. It's, it's so individual. That's like saying what painting you should like. It's what moves you, what appeals to you. Certainly some people buy watches for status or buy watches because they're an alternative store of wealth. That's probably a small percentage of the market. More people than that buy them for personal style, fashion, or because they just like them. That's me. I buy stuff not necessarily because it's the most expensive or going to gain the most value, just because I like it. You've been on the platform for so long, and just recently you started on eBay Live. So tell me about that experience. eBay Live is a great, great medium. It's kind of like Twitch, so it's streaming, but you can load into the console your items making it the most remarkably interactive. You know, sure, I guess a Twitch streamer can interact with their audience, but can they sell them a watch directly during that live stream? It's it's remarkable. So I, I did it. I did maybe 30K of business during this one, which is heavily promoted by eBay. And I don't expect that I'll have six or 7,000 live concurrent users initially. But my take on it was I'm going to offer good deals. I'm going to offer in person the best deal live to make it sort of appointment viewing. That if I'm doing it live, you want to watch it because you can get a very good deal. Maybe I'll blow things out at a loss or true wholesale because it's good for me. If I know that every three or four weeks I can turn inventory that's sitting and not moving, say la vie, on to the next one and I'm happy to pass along good deals. It's pretty remarkable where I'll have my phone out and in real time accept offers. This is amazing. I'm not a retailer. I don't want to retail. I want to pass along good deals and sell as much as possible. And you're doing a great job at it. Okay. So you obviously must have developed a ton of relationships that benefit your business throughout the years. Can you share why community is important to you and why you would encourage all sellers to get involved in the community or at least try to build one of their own? This is what I've seen change about watches over the years. There's always been community. My dad's mentor was this guy who was the NAWCC, the National Association of Watch and Clock Collectors. Member number two was my dad's mentor, and I'm member number 156,000 something. When I was a teenager and going to watch shows with my dad, it was greatest generation guys in L.L. Bean fishing vests. You know, the more pockets, the better. And what they were after was different stuff. So they were after bubble backs and mostly pocket watches, mostly American Railroad watches. And then things changed. Things changed in the aughts with Hodinkee. So Hodinkee publishes and the level of interest from sort of normal people just starts to skyrocket for the next decade until it's sort of zenith where we're at now. There always was a watch community and it was small, but now there's a watch community and it is huge and it has niches within that watch community or whatever it is that you're into. You're into independence. Cool. You just want to focus on Omega. Cool. Rolex. It, it's endless. It's an incredible hobby. It's, it's almost a black hole. You know, there's almost a fear to enter in because there's so much to know. There's so many facets to watch. It's like uh, being overwhelmed by choice. Where do you begin? But I have community in repeat business. I have community in people who come to me and know that they're going to get a fair shake, a good deal. And that's where it sort of exists for me. But for anybody getting involved in this, it's a heck of a community. And you know, it used to be so male-dominated and now it isn't. You know, I have a watch brand that I revitalized with my wife that's led by her. I have this brand, Wellsbro, W-E-L-S-B-R-O, wellsbro.com. And Wellsbro was a watch producer from the 20s through the early 70s, and they went out of business with the quartz crisis. In a nutshell, the quartz crisis is quartz technology creating an existential crisis in watch making, watch manufacturers. How can we exist making mechanical watches in a world that they're technologically obsolete? And, you know, of course, it was answered over decades that this is an art and people want to preserve that art. But a lot of brands didn't make it through the quartz crisis. It was a time of upheaval and consolidation and Wellsboro didn't make it through. And it's a brand we revitalized. And there's been a real push by brands and by the industry itself 
to be more inclusive to women. And I even see it, like I'll see it in my stats. I'm, I'm not as good on Instagram as I used to be. Again, it's just hard for me to find the motivation to care, but it's gone from maybe like 90, 10 men to women who are viewing my content, probably closer to like 75, 25-ish. It's still a ways off uh, and it could get much, much better, but I think it's, it's something that is happening and getting a lot better. I love that. There's, you know, there's hope for us women to take over the watch industry one day. <laughs> Where can listeners find you and your store online? TimeTitans.com is just a mirror of what's on eBay. I'm probably not even as updated. So the, the best place to see me is you know, ebay.com slash time titans. That's where I want to sell. That's where I do sell. I'm in LA. I'm super easy to get a hold of and communicate with. And I'm always happy to show stuff and find a way to meet people where they are. Is there like a drop that you do? Do you like kind of promote this drop coming up? We've been lucky enough to have good watch publicity on the various watch medias and they're small enough releases. We're, we're, we're a micro, micro brand, really small releases, 12 pieces, 30 pieces. One was four pieces, a handmade watch we did. I think our next watch is a Pilot's Chrono using a um, Omega, a caliber 1164. It's like a 7750 in Anybody's listening who knows watches, they'll, they'll know this stuff. From the early 2000s, we're going to make 40 pieces. I'm hoping that'll be in two colorways. I'm hoping that'll be September. Then after that, we're looking at a diver where hopefully we're able to make bigger numbers because that's probably the biggest complaint is that we haven't been able to make enough. That's something we're working on. I think Wellsboro is a, it's a pet project for my wife and I. Wellsboro for us is a client that won't say no. It's uh, a way to do whatever we want to do and not be constrained. It's a way for me to make the watches that I want to wear, which is really cool because I, st I still love watches. I still collect watches. I, I genuinely get excited about watches. Literally during this podcast, I'm looking down my phone. And I'm seeing that I'm being pinged about making quotes for stuff, you know, so it doesn't stop. A lot of things ahead in the future for you. It's really exciting. And I will let you get back to, you know, all those questions you're getting. But thank you so much for being here today, Rich. Thank you so much. Rich Reichback sells on eBay under the store name Time Titans. Shop his store for vintage, modern, and collectible watches. We hope you'll join us on our next episode where we'll shine the spotlight on another seller with an amazing story to share. I'm your host, Georgia Mampanis. Jim Griffith is our editor-in-chief. The eBay Seller Spotlight Podcast is produced by Lipson and Podcast 411.